Father, we just thank you for your word that we come to this morning, Lord, as you lead us through your word, as you speak to us through your word, as you encourage us, Father, and guide us. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you've prepared each heart to hear what you want them to hear, Lord, including myself, Father. Help us, Lord, to have our spiritual eyes open and our spiritual ears open, Lord, that we might not miss anything that you have to say to us. And I ask all these things in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The title of today's message is The Power of Perspective. The Power of Perspective. When we look at things in the natural, we look at things out of our own flesh, we see things through our own flesh. We see things through our own colored glasses that we're wearing. Because you know, all, as we grow up, before we know the Lord, we, things happen to us. You all know that. Things, things come upon us that are, have nothing to do with who we are, really. and some, They come from the outside. But then sometimes things come upon us that we had a lot to do with. Hello. We brought it on ourselves in many cases. But in some cases we didn't, and it comes from the outside. But the point is that when we look at these things that are happening to us at those times, we look at them through our own glasses. My glasses are different than your glasses. Your glasses are different than mine. We see them through our own glasses. Sometimes we call them colored glasses that are colored by the way that we were raised or by the things that happened to us. But, you, but then as the time passes and we come to know the Lord, we come into a saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and we begin to realize who, how all-powerful our Father is in heaven and that He guides us and directs us, that He wants the highest and the best for us. But that doesn't mean we're always going to have the highest and the best. Right? Because sometimes we have consequences to pay from the past. That was really weak yup. <laughs> Apparently, I'm the only one that's had to pay consequences from the past. I have too. You have too. Praise God. You and I. Just you and I. Right? And so, but then we look at these things today with our own colored glasses on. If we have not taken off those colored glasses that we, that we received from the way we were raised, from who we are, who we have become, if we don't take those off, we do not see things as God sees them. And we need to see them from God's perspective. We look here in the natural and we see certain things happening around us. But God is up there and he sees it all. He knows what was coming, what's coming. He knows what the past is. He knows what our decisions are that we're making today or tomorrow. He knows it, everything. And what we need more than anything is to gain God's perspective. We need to know how does God see what I'm doing. Does God approve of what I'm doing? Has he led me to what I'm doing? Is he guiding me? Is he speaking to me? Are the words I'm speaking coming from the Lord or are they coming right smack out of my flesh? You know, sometimes my flesh, well, most of the time, my flesh, and there's enough of it and I want no more comments made, <laughs> speak louder than God. Turn to someone and say, me too. <laughs> Our flesh and what we want to happen speaks louder than what God is telling us. And then sometimes when God speaks to us and he gives us a direction, we go, okay. And we start in that direction. But then about four steps in, we go, I don't think I like this. And God says nothing because he already gave us the direction. And we, so we say, God, are you sure this is what you told me? Sometimes he says yes. Lots of times he doesn't say anything. Because see, he doesn't repeat himself that often. How many times did you, when you're raising kids, repeat yourself? No. 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 I had a little boy in my house yesterday. He's a great <coughs> grandchild. One year old. That's all I heard all day long. No, 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 don't touch that. No, 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 no. You can't pick the dog up by your ears. No. <laughs> he went home thinking his name had been changed to no. <laughs> so we need God's perspective. Am I the only one that needs it? Or Okay, good. Turn to someone and say, I need God's perspective. I need to get out of my flesh and get God's perspective. Amen. Praise God. So... We're going to start with 1 Kings, chapter 16. We are still talking about Elijah. 
There is so much to be learned by, from Elijah. I'll pick Elijah up again when, well he's not that heavy, he's pretty light, but I'll pick him up again when we get home. But there's so much to learn from Elijah and so I wanted to get to a certain point by today, since Marcy and I leave on Thursday morning, early, uh, so that we had, you had some summation of Elijah. Remember I said everything that Elijah went through. Remember when God sent him to the brook, right? And the, and the ravens fed him and he had meat and he had everything and the ravens fed him. I mean, that's pretty awesome. There are people who don't believe this book is true. They believe it's just a bunch of stories. I'm sorry, your pastor believes it's all true. Amen. Everything that's written in this book happened and it happened for a reason. Amen. And it, in that time it had a reason, but today it has a reason for why it happened at that time, so that in this time we can get God's perspective. That's, right. that's the only way we can get it. And so he sent him to the brook, and the ravens fed him, and that's pretty awesome, I think. And then, and then what happened to the brook? After a year later, remember there was a drought, and the brook dried up. Now he's sitting in front of a dried up brook, and that's where we left it last week. <laughs> we left a whole bunch of people sitting at a dried up brook. Because everything is dried up that you thought was going to be so good. The money isn't coming in. Nothing's working. Maybe there's a layoff. Maybe you can't find a job. Whatever in the world it is, the brook is dry. Because in Elijah's day, there had been a drought. So, 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. I'm going to do a little bit of review. So if it's a, rep a repeat to you, that's okay. And Ahab... The son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. He was a king. Ahab was a king. Omri, when, up until Omri's time, through Omri's time, the Bible says Omri did more evil than anybody before him. Then his son Ahab did more evil than all of those that were before him. And it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel. So it wasn't bad enough what he had done before. Then he runs out and he finds Jezebel. Wow, we all know that, right? We've heard the story of Jezebel. He married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve and worship Baal. How many of you know what the uh, god, small g, of Baal is? Baal, that god, is the god of weather, among other things, but the god of weather. So in 2 Kings, chapter 17, verse 1, Elijah comes and predicts a drought. Now, so that's why you had to know that Baal is the god of weather, storms, rain. And of course, the whole countryside was worshiping Baal. The whole countryside was worshiping everything except God, our God. A most high God, a most holy God. They were worshiping other things. Sounds kind of like the world today. Yes. Just a little bit. So, now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives. I want you to understand this picture. Elijah, who is nobody... When they say he's a Tishbite, that was the lowest group of people in the Israel nation. That was the lowest group. He was a part of that group. And he received a word from the Lord to go to the king and tell him these words. And so he just dances right up there to the king. I wonder how long it took him saying, God, is that really you? You really want me to do this? How many of us do that? Do you really want me to go do that? Ooh, that's kind of scary. We talked last week about how would you like to go to, to talk to our president? And you're just going to go tell him that the world is falling apart and that the stock market is going to crash and it's going to keep crashing until you get it all together. How many of you would like to do that? How many of you think you'd even get through to him? I don't mean through to him. I mean through all the protectors. Okay, so he says, um, As the Lord of God of Israel lives before whom I stand which means he stands in the firm and solid belief of an almighty God. Surely there will be neither dew nor rain these, these years except by my word. Okay, that's a pretty dramatic word. Because remember, who is the God? Who is Baal? Weather the weather God. And so he says, there's going to be no more rain for these years. For three years, as a matter of fact. 
So he is directly opposing the God that everybody's worshiping. This must be a problem. Do you know what the word, what the name Elijah means? Elijah means, Lord is my God. That's what Elijah means. So in Kings 18, just a little refresher course here. Kings 18, verses 1 through 4. Now it came about after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, okay, three years have passed, the drought, I mean the drought is, it's really dry there. Go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it came about when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. Obadiah loved the Lord. And so even though that, in, but he's worked for Ahab, but even though that edict was put out, put out and he knew that if he did not do what she, Jezebel said to do, he would be killed. But still, still he managed to save a hundred and he hid them away and he supplied them with, with food and with water. And then in verse 16. Uh, well, before we get to verse 16, the king told him to go and they needed to find some more food for the cattle and things like that. And he's, look, he's been looking for Elijah for three years. He would like to find Elijah because he'd like to kill Elijah. He believes Elijah caused all this problem. But actually, who caused the problem? The king caused the problem and the people. So in verse 16, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah because Obadiah found Elijah. Baal idols were often made in the shape of a bull, representing strength and fertility and reflecting lust for power and sexual pleasure. Evil kings hated the prophets. Why did they hate the prophets? Because they spoke against sin and idolatry and undetermined uh, and undermined the control over the people. Why do people today hate, hate prophets? Same reason. Because a true prophet speaks against the sins that are in the world. A true prophet, if a true prophet walks into a church, is asked to come and speak, and speaks in that church, and there is sin in the church, if it's a true prophet, the prophet will speak up and point it out. That's why we don't have any prophets except me. I'm not going to point anything out. <laughs> now, you know that that's not true, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know that that is not true in this church. So, because we, do, we, do, we don't point it out. We ask for repentance. We ask for understanding, we ask for compassion. So, Elijah challenged the people to take a stand, to follow what was true, the true God. Why did so many people waver between the two choices that they had? Either follow God or don't follow God. Why do so many people today waver? They're afraid. What else? Consequences from that. Consequences? What else? They don't want to give up their flesh, their lifestyle. They might have to change something. What else? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge is many times what it is. Maybe they're not going to church or they're going to church and nobody preaches anymore. Nobody preaches about sin. I promise we'll be off sin sometime in the next six weeks or so. <laughs> nobody preaches about sin anymore. Nobody, nobody teaches the people about what happens. It's important to take a stand for the Lord. We need to, as a church and as a body and as individuals, we need to take a stand for the Lord. We need to stand up when people come and they say they're doing this or that or the other thing. We need to either speak up or what? Shut up. <laughs> speak up or shut up. Okay. All right. Clean, clean that up a little bit when you do the video. So sometimes we just kind of drift along because we're kind of, it's kind of pleasant where we are. We don't really want to have to change anything. We don't want to have to, you know, make life more difficult. We certainly don't want to have to face the fact that maybe, just maybe, there's some sin in our life. Or maybe we have to face the fact that we've been worshiping a false god. And that false god is named me. How do we do that? How do we manage to worship me? You, I, at the beginning of this story, Elijah was declared, had declared a drought in the beginning of 17. 
by declaring that there should be no rain. Elijah made an outright challenge to the God of rain. And since Ahab and Jezebel have declared that all of Israel is safe as a, as a result of their declaration that everybody should worship Baal uh, as a state religion, it's also putting Ahab in a very bad political position. You know, our leaders don't like being put in a bad political position. There are several right now that are being put into a bad political position. If his official god of rain and storms did not make rain, then perhaps Ahab himself is not protected by that chosen deity either. If the, if the god of rain doesn't bring rain, then what is the god of rain doing? Nothing. Nothing. So what good is a god of rain that can't make rain? Worthless. Right? Worthless. So when we pick up the story in chapter 18, the drought has been going on for three years. The people of Israel are becoming desperate. And as a direct consequence, then Ahab and Jezebel are also becoming desperate. So although Elijah was alone in his confrontation of Ahab and Jezebel, he was not the only one in Israel who believed in God. Because we've already heard about the prophets that were killed and the hundred that were protected and saved. By... So the Bible speaks of Jezebel killing off the prophets of God. Even Elijah was has been in hiding from Jezebel for three years. Notice where God told Elijah to go. Remember, we talked about it last week. He told him to go east of the Jordan. He went right into the heart, you probably don't know this, of Baal country. He went right into the very heart of Baal country. He went right into the very place where Jezebel was born. Now that's going right into the face of the enemy, right? That's like when we travel overseas and, and we go right into the witch doctor's community. I love to do that. That's the way I was born. I just love to go right there on the edge someplace. Right into, right into the witch doctors. They don't like that much. They get really upset. So, so his, and, and they've challenged me on occasion. For example, you know, do you know that witch doctors can... can can witch doctor <laughs> and manifest things that appear to be real to the individual that they're against. And so on one particular occasion, right in the middle of a strong witchcraft area, we chose to do a crusade. And I was the primary speaker, pastor, preacher. What do you suppose, where do you suppose that puts my face? Right in front of the witch doctors. So we had just a powerful, powerful uh, time one night and many came to the Lord, and a couple of young people who were learning to be witch doctors burned all their witchcraft stuff that night. It was a powerful time. I had taken my sister with me on that particular occasion. We get back to the little house we were staying in. There were two twin beds, and we sat down on the edge of the bed, and just like Marcy and I do today, we debriefed. Oh, wow, did you see that? Oh, wow, did you see that? Wasn't that awesome the way God moved? Did you see that man get up out of his wheelchair and throw his cane aside? That's a true story. Did you see all that? Yes, we talked it all over, all over again. And then we're getting kind of tired by that time. She gets into her bed. I sit down on the edge of my bed. I pull up the covers and I slip my feet into the bed and stretch to the bottom. Ah! I touch something cold in my, my fit, feet. And I raised up the cover. There was a snake down there at the foot of my bed. And my feet touched the snake. Now that snake had been conjured up by a witch doctor. Is the snake real? Yes. <laughs> no, yes, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, it was cold when I touched it. And I jumped out of bed and said, oh my gosh, there's a snake in my bed. Linda said, oh no, we raised up the cover. There was no snake. Witch doctrine is real, you know. Yes. We, you know that we know the spiritual realm, right? We know that our God and our Holy Spirit are powerful. We see the Holy Spirit move today. We see the Holy Spirit touch people and heal people. So we know that's true. And so is witch doctrine. It's just that my God. Anybody say my God. My God is much more powerful. Hallelujah. So praise the Lord. Uh, so, so at the brook. At the book Kareth, Elijah is fed by the ravens. And this is doubly unheard of for a prophet of the Lord since ravens were unclean animals. I mean, I think just, just being fed by a bird is pretty awesome. 
But then, then when I study and I find out that the raven is considered unclean, and yet it's the raven that fed Elijah, God can use even the enemy when he chooses to. So, and he eats bread and meat of unknown origin. Elijah eats unkosher food in the land outside the bounds of the promised land because that is where God has directed him. He was obedient and he went where God has told him to go. So, but once the stream dries up, God sends Elijah to Zarephath of Sidon, where in, remember, that it's been a three year drought. This is the very heart of Jezebel's birthplace. Yet Elijah finds a woman there. Remember, a widow woman and with her son. And he doesn't have a problem getting along with her. In fact, he finds a woman willing to give up her last meal in order to feed the prophet of God, whom she doesn't even know. And by doing so, she manages to have enough to eat for all of them in the family for several days. And then we know the son gets sick. And what does Elijah do? Come on, I've been teaching for how many years? What does Elijah do? No, he, he prays, but he goes up and he lays down on the boy, remember? And just the presence of God within him heals that little boy. I'd say that widow was pretty fortunate that she came to meet a man by the name of Elijah. Elijah went and did what God told him to do. She did what God told her to do through Elijah. And they both uh, grew in that. And eventually he saves her son from death. And when the woman, who was likely a worshiper of Baal herself, sees that her son has been saved, she comes to believe in the God of Elijah. How many of us need to go where God has called us to, do, to go and to speak truth? But also, I don't know how much preaching he really did there. It doesn't say that he did that much. It just says that he did what God told him to do, and God blessed it. And the, the widow was blessed. Widow, the widow was blessed. His, her son was saved. All because Elijah did what he was told to do. And through Elijah, she sees a great miracle in her life. As we go through our lives, our job is to do the same, to bring the blessings of the Lord to those who do not know the Lord, who do not know those blessings themselves. And so in chapter 18, starting with verse 7, Now as Obadiah was on his way, Behold, Elijah met him, and he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is this you, Elijah, my master? Now, Obadiah is a bit stunned. They've been looking for him, for Elijah, for three years, and they haven't found him. And all of a sudden, Obadiah is out there looking for food for the cattle, when all of a sudden he looks up and here comes Elijah. Imagine his surprise. And he said to him, Elijah said, It is I, verse 8, It is I, go, say to your master, Behold, Elijah is here. Verse 9, and Obadiah is scared to death. He says, What sin have I committed that you're giving your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death? And now he begins to whine too. As the Lord your God lives, there's no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent to search for you. And when they said he is not here, he made the kingdom or nation swear that they couldn't find you. And now, now, you're saying, Go say to your master, Behold, Elijah is here. Obadiah is scared to death. Verse 12, And it will come about when I leave you that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you where I do not know. I know that the minute I take my eyes off you, you're going to disappear. And then I'm going to tell, Eli I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell the king, here, Elijah's right here, and he's going to look, and you're not here, and I'm going to die. Do you not care, Elijah? And so when I come and tell Ahab Ben, he cannot find you, he will kill me, although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Verse 13, has it not been told to my master what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, that I hid a hundred prophets of the Lord by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water? And now you're saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. He will kill me. And he said, whining and whining. Verse 15, and Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. Verse 16, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Okay, verse 17, and it came about when Ahab said, saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? Why does he call Elijah a troubler? Elijah is a prophet. Elijah preaches truth. 
Because he points out sin. He's a troubler. Verse 18, and he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. Elijah says, it's not me that caused the problem. You're the cause of the problem. Because of the sin and because of the way you've led the people and because you've been worshiping Baal, you're the cause of the problem, not me. Anybody out there listening? Yes. The source of Israel's trouble was not Elijah or even the drought, but they had abandoned the Lord's covenant. Our nation today in many ways has abandoned the Lord's covenant. There are, church, there are churches that are much more into entertainment than they are to preaching the truth of the word of God. They are abandoning the Lord's covenant. Do you know how, do you know how many prophets ate at Jezebel's table? Oh, close to 900. 850. 850. He's looking in his Bible. Oh, what a clever place to look. 850 prophets who ate at Jezebel's table. So, Elijah brings the stalemate to a head by challenging Baal to a very public duel. In verse 20. Verse 18, chapter 18, verse 20. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. How many years ago did all this happen? It's always a test here. You never know. It's always a test. How many years, how many years ago? What? A long, long time ago. Very good. That is very astute. 2,900 years ago approximately. 2,900 years ago. And it's very relevant today. People say, oh, I don't read the Old Testament because that's, that's, you know, that's the Old Testament. I only go read the New Testament. You better read the Old Testament because there's more teaching in the Old Testament almost than there is in the New Testament. And the Old Testament is what opens up the New Testament. So, oh, wow, okay. Okay, where am I? Verse 20. 21? Yes, that would be good. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? And that's what the world is out there. Well, some of the world isn't even hesitating. They're just following Baal or any other gods or themselves, whatever. Um, but there's many of the world who, I don't know if it's true. I don't know if there is a God. If, you, if the Lord is God, verse 21, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Why did they not respond? When Elijah said, here's your challenge, either follow God or follow Baal. Why didn't they answer? Ignorance. Ignorance, I believe. My belief. My Bible doesn't say that. That's what I believe. They didn't know. They didn't know why they should follow God. They didn't even know for sure why they should follow Baal, except they've been following Baal for their fathers and ancestors have been following Baal. How many things do we do because our parents did them? I'll even get a little political. How many vote Republican or Democrat because your parents were that same? I mean, that's, we do, I'm a Democrat. I talked to somebody the other day and they said, I said, uh, you know, where are you? And they said, well, I'm a Democrat. Are you? How do you know you're a Democrat? Well, my parents were Democrats. <laughs> I'm just saying, we have to watch and know why we're thinking the way we're thinking and what we do. So verse 22, then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. I love it when Elijah says that. Does that sound like I'm the only one? <laughs> Everybody else ran away. Not true. He gets feeling a little sorry for himself right there, but I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450. They're prophets of the Baal, and they're prophets of uh, the other gods, so, to which totaled 850, the Asherah. Verse 20, so, or verse uh, 24. 23. Now let them give us two oxen, and let them choose one ox for themselves, and cut it up, and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox, and lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. 24, then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered and said, that's a really good idea. <laughs> Let's do that. 
Now, the prophets of Baal, what did they, what did they believe? There's going to be fire, they believe. That, that's that's going to happen. And, and Elijah, you're going to be done. You're going to be cooked in the fire. So, so in this story, Elijah's challenging Baal to the very act that he's supposed to be the master of, bringing fire down from heaven. The prophets of Baal had to place the bull on some wood, and as they pray to Baal, he should easily hear their cries and take one of the lightning bolts, because that's how he was that's how he was always drawn, with a lightning bolt in his hand. And all he had to do was take one of his lightning bolts right down there, and everything would go up, and all oh, the prophets of Baal would be happy, and so would Jezebel, and so would Ahab. But notice, Elijah places himself at an additional disadvantage by letting the prophets of Baal go first. So in verse 25, So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one ox for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many. <laughs> it's kind of sarcastic too. That's why I really like him. Um, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but don't put any fire under it. <laughs> So the contest really is this. First one to light the fire wins. That's really what the contest is. But Elijah, Elijah doesn't begin his prayer. He is so confident that God, in God that he gives Baal the prophets an unencumbered first chance. You get to start. So often for you and I, we are so insecure in our own place with God that we're not content to just stand by and let him work. Am I talking to anybody here? We kind of, okay, he, he, God said to do this. Okay, we just jump right in there and start doing things. We start helping him. You know, my God doesn't need any help. In fact, I'm the biggest hindrance he has in my life. But we'll step in there to help him work this thing out. Because God, this is too big for you. But we'll, I'll get in here because, see, you don't know the people like I know the people. I know all the people. I know what they're thinking. I know what they're going to do. So you just get, give me a minute and I'll take care of all the issues. And when I'm ready for you, you can do something. <laughs> Hello. God says, go do this. And we say, well, I, gotta, I, I have to lay some groundwork first. God said, no, I'm the groundwork. You go do this. We're so insecure. Or uh, maybe it won't work the way he says it will work, so I need to help him. It's not always that we doubt him, but who are we doubting? Ourselves. It's not always that we doubt God, it's that we doubt ourselves. So, we fear that we may not have heard the word of the Lord correctly. And so we're not content to wait for him to do something. We jump in too soon. And we, but we need to learn to wait. Anybody here have trouble waiting on what God says? So verse 26. Then they took the ox which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning till noon saying, Oh Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered and they leapt up about the altar which they had made. Hmm. Uh, things are not going well for the prophets of Baal. Their God has not answered all their prayers. Try as they might, no lightning from heaven came down. Nothing started a fire. It was, and remember it was extremely dry. Three years of drought, so all it would have taken was a teeny little spark. Baal did not need a big fire to light this altar, just a small spark. But because there was no Baal to answer, there was no spark to light the dead dry wood. 27. And it came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is God. Either he's occupied, or he's gone aside, or maybe he's on a journey, or maybe he's asleep. And needs to be awake. And now Elijah gets really sarcastic. He's beginning to have a really good time with them. So um, he's getting pretty cocky. He starts making fun. Maybe Baal's asleep. It's no coincidence that God told mankind in the second commandment, Thou shalt not make any graven images. Because when we make a graven image, we usually make it pretty much looks like us with our same thoughts and our same feelings and acts the same way we do. So verse 28. So they cried out with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. 29. And it came about when midday was past that they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Now Elijah's having a really great time. I mean, I, I, wish, I'd have, I wish I'd have been there. I've been up on Mount Carmel to see where this 
took place, they believe the place that it took place, pretty, it's pretty powerful to go up there. The gods were silent because they were not real. The gods we may be tempted to follow, not idols of wood or stone, but idols that we put within ourselves. Power, status, appearance, material possessions can become our gods if we let them. I know nobody here is in that issue, but sometimes it happens. Verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. Verse 31, and Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name. Verse 32, so with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. 33, then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood and he said, fill. And you might mark in your Bible, if you have your Bible open, fill four, mark four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Verse 34. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. Mark third. And they did it a third time. And the water flowed around the altar and also filled the trench of the water. Remember, they're three years into the drought. Elijah is going to leave no doubt who's the source of this miracle that's about to happen. The, the number four is symbolic for the world. Okay? He poured water, the number four, he poured that all over, symbolic of the world. Our world today. How can I put this? Our world today is like that water. It covers everything. Our world, the world of sin. And number three, the number three, three times means divine, Yahweh. This is not an accidental spark that ignites this bonfire. No spont spontaneous combustion here. No, this fire is from only one place. He even causes the people to bring him the most thing most precious to them, what little water they had. And he, asked, he doesn't ask for a little bit of it. He asks for all of it. And then in verse 36, Then it came about, at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, today let it be known that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that thou art Lord, our God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Okay, see. Now the reason that Elijah gives for why God should answer his prayer is not so that Elijah can say, see how great I am, but so that the people will know that he is acting according to God's will, so that the people will know that the Lord is God. God does not give you what you ask when you ask for your reasons. Are you with me? God doesn't give you what you ask for your reasons. God gives you something for his reason. If it shows his power in order to save the lost and cause them to believe, then he will do it. God flashed fire from the heaven for Elijah, and he will help us accomplish anything that he commands us to do. The proof may not be as dramatic in our lives as in Elijah's, but in verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust, licked up the water that was in the trench, in verse 39, and when all the faces... People saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God, the Lord is God. Let's read that together. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is Praise the Lord. And so then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, all 850 of them. Do not let one of them escape. Soon, so they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. I have often wondered, how did he, how did he kill 850? Had to be the Lord. He had to have gone, you're dead. Right. <sighs> it had to be the Lord because he didn't kill 850 all by himself. So one interesting note is the Lord, he is God, is, in Hebrew is Elijah. So the people were shouting, Elijah, 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 Elijah. It's kind of like chanting at a game. I don't believe that they were... 
shouting the name of the prophet, but I, maybe that's where he actually got his name. So Elijah takes advantage of this recent victory to get rid of all these false prophets, but the miracle doesn't end there. The God of Elijah has one more trick to rub in Baal's face. And in verse 18, chapter 18, verse 41, Now Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. So Ahab went up and eat and drank, but Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and he looked and he said, There's nothing. And he said, Go back seven times. And it came about at the seventh time that he said, Behold, a cloud as small as a man's fist is coming up from the sea. And he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you. So it came about in a little while, the sky grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy shower, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he outran Ahab to Jezreel. When you stand up on the top of Mount Carmel, and you look down over that valley, that huge valley that's there, it was seven miles from Mount Carmel to Jezreel. And who outran who? Why, why was he in such a hurry? Why was Elijah in such a hurry? I think he went there because he wanted to get the story told right first on exactly what had happened. The Bible doesn't tell us. That's my speculation. So the God of Israel, the God of Elijah, shows the God of the weather who's boss. One more thing. 19, 1 through 4. I'm sorry, it's my last sermon before I go. You're stuck with it. <laughs> Chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. And Ahab told Jezebel all Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself. Now this is big tough prophet. And he's up there now whining to himself and to God. And he says, it is enough now. Oh Lord, take my life for I am not better than my father's. And he lay down, slept under a juniper tree and behold, there was an angel touching him and he said to him, arise and eat. We know the rest of the story. What happened to Elijah? How did this strong prophet of God become this man who's saying, just take my life. Just, just kill me. Now you might as well kill me now. Is this the same man? The answer, I believe, is that the first Elijah was Elijah, the man of God. As a man of God, he could do great miracles. When he was listening to the Holy Spirit, when God was speaking to him, he can pray prayers that bring down fire. He can demand that the people kill the false prophets. But Elijah, the man, he's scared and he's lonely. He runs from Jezebel into Judah. Elijah experienced the depths of fatigue and discouragement just after his two greatest victories. The defeat of the prophets of Baal and the answers of prayer for rain. He fires his servant. He goes up to the wilderness. By the way, the mountain that he went up to was where Moses received the Ten Commandments. The reaction is more common than most people realize. So the lessons we learn from Elijah's life. Often discouragement sets in after great spiritual experience, especially those requiring physical effort or involving great emotion. We're never closer to defeat than at the moments of our greatest victory. We are never as alone as we may feel. God is always there no matter what you feel. God speaks more frequently in persistent whispers than he does when he shouts. Anyone who knows a preacher very well is aware of this reaction. A minister can get up in the pulpit and when the Spirit of the Lord descends on him or her, he can call fire down out of heaven. People are healed, blind eyes see, people pray, shout, sing, speak in tongues, all the things that Pentecostals do. And when they leave the church, they leave satisfied, hungry for more. But the preacher leaves exhausted and vulnerable. He or she wonders if they did enough, if they said enough, if they said too much. Because when the spirit leaves him or her, she's just like Elijah. The devil will immediately begin to attack. The devil cannot attack when the spirit is moving powerfully upon them. When anointed, the preacher is a fierce warrior. But when church is over, 
the preacher is vulnerable. Anyone who knows a preacher well is familiar with the after church blues. You need to pray for pastors of churches. Every time we leave church fed, the pastor leaves empty. The people leave it spiritually armored. The preacher leaves spiritually naked. Pray that, like Elijah, the Lord will send ravens to comfort the pastors that you know. God bless you.